Any bag should leave now. Um, it, it could be worse. Um, I could be speaking in the language of my parents' generation who came from Yugoslavia to London, so it's not Serbo Croat today. <laughs> And also, I'm following a very hard act. Um, we've just had a, a, a remarkable presentation on the way that digital technology is changing the way that we understand uh, culture of all kinds. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, what is design doing in the world of the museum. Um, partly it starts from a, a personal voyage um, in the early days of the Design Museum, which was founded back in the 1980s. It would have been possible to tell the story of design through a selection of well-chosen chairs. Um, we have this obsession with the chair. Um, the Smithsons, the um, wonderful British architects, once wrote a powerful essay which suggested that humans uh, have emotional engagement with chairs because they are symmetrical, they have arms and legs, um, and they're handy to put your jacket on. Um, and then I was in a conversation with Rolf Feldbaum, the founder of the Vitra Furniture Company, who came up with the fascinating point that um, if you want to purchase a, a red-blue chair um, designed and possibly made by Garrett Rietveld, um, at auction you would pay perhaps a tenth or even a fifth or a twentieth of the price of a Mondrian painting from the same year, 1918. Um, why is this? Why is it that we see art as somehow um, more... Well, valuable is a difficult term to, pr to, to relate to price, but why is it that we see them as more culturally significant? You could say that um, the Mondrian painting had the same level of emotional intensity as, as the Rietveld object. Uh, and then I found myself reading um, the work of a late 19th century American uh, economist, Torsten Veblen. Um, he's quite difficult to read, but I recommend it still. He was an economist who looked at economics from the point of view of social behaviors. Uh, he was the first person to use the term um, conspicuous consumption, and he wrote a book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, in which he suggested that uh, all cultures have a social pyramid at which the point of which are at the top of which are those who don't need to work and they reflect that status by conspicuously showing the things that are signs that they don't need to work so for example white clothing might be a sign of high social status because you don't have to worry about um, uh, cleaning it because someone else will do it for you uh, in the 19th century northern Europeans um, valued uh, pale white skins initially because because it showed they didn't have to work in the fields. Later on, um, they discovered the joys of travel to the south of France, so then a suntan briefly became a, a sign of high social status until it became clear that it was bad for your health and was triggering um, skin cancers. Uh, so I go back to this image here, which uh, is one of the pivotal events of the 19th century, the Crystal Palace of 1851, um, a celebration uh, of the Industrial Revolution, uh, a remarkable project realized by Henry Cole, a man who not only invented the Christmas card, but also persuaded Prince Albert to put his name to this project. Uh, he went on to start the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, he started the Royal College of Art in London, a series of extraordinary events. And he created this object which was in some ways the summation of the modern world. It was a moment when technology was as disruptive as it is in our own time. The digital revolution has transformed the way that we understand things and objects and their meanings. And this was a similar moment when mass production had completely altered the relationship of the user with the maker. Um, the era of craft production, there was a direct relationship between the user and the maker, the machine and mass production cut that link and introduced this new role of the designer whose job was partly to make sense of what objects were, partly to create new forms and categories of things that hadn't existed previously. And at a time when there was a sense that a lot of um, work needed to be done to find canons to understand ways in which these objects could be best realized. 
And Henry Cole felt that he knew the answer. He felt that there was such a thing as good design and therefore also such a thing as bad design. So his project uh, after the Great Exhibition was to start um, what became the Victorian Albert Museum. It began life in Marlborough House here. Uh, on the right is the design school he had there. And he saw his job as finding ways to give manufacturers and students a sense of what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And of course, being a, a great impresario, as most museum directors need to be, he also knew the way to attract attention. So in his museum of good practice was also what he called the Chamber of Horrors. And these are four examples of what he saw as being horrifically bad design, um, including overuse of natural forms in inappropriate ways, playing around with surfaces and depths. Uh, but he, had a, he at least had the good grace to confess that the public found his chamber of horrors the most uh, attractive part of the museum. And in due course, he led, it led to the creation of the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, a remarkable place. Uh, it's where the Design Museum um, began its existence. Um, it now has something like four million objects uh, in its uh, amazing uh, space. But it's actually, over the years, it's changed its meaning. For Henry Cole, design was looking forward. It was about mass production and engaging uh, with that world. And given um, the British uh, suspicions of utility, uh, and its associations with trade, the V&A transformed itself very fast into, um, one could say, a museum of the most exquisite decorative arts. But this was the time when all sorts of people started looking at finding ways of understanding meaning from objects. So this is uh, one, one of um, Gottfried Semper's ideas about um, examining that you could actually tell almost everything about a culture from the utilitarian objects it produced. So uh, one of these is Greek, another is Egyptian, with a sense that uh, these show whether you're actually gathering water from a, a fast-moving river or from the sea. And that sense that you could actually explore a culture to find meaning, to understand the world around us through design objects has a long history. Uh, and you could say that uh, in the mid-20th century, the way that Roland Barthes, for example, started to explore uh, the significance of mass-produced industrial objects to try to give them a sense of meaning. Uh, Barthes actually described the Citroën DS19 as uh, the exact um, equivalent of the 20th century of the building of the cathedrals at Chartres, the sense that a mass effort by many people produced a remarkable object which, as he put it, seemed to have descended from the heavens, this floating object. Uh, and you could say now that maybe some of these differences between design and art are eroding. Um, you could understand uh, Kuhn's work very much as uh, mirroring the process of design. So there is a studio uh, that Kuhn's maintains in which draftsmen produce detailed specifications and drawings for how these objects are made. And then they are shipped to a factory in Germany where the values by which we judge these objects, the level of finish, the smoothness, the hiding of the manufacturing process, are pretty close to the ways that we explore uh, a Ferrari's surface and finish. There is this kind of conjunction. Through history, people have attempted to tell us what good design means. Um, there has been, since the days of William Morris, uh, who uh, distinguished himself on his 18th birthday, taken to the Great Exhibition by his mother as, as a birthday treat, refused to go inside on the basis that everything inside it would be machine-made and therefore of not much value. Um, he and many others have seen a, a moral connection between the idea of good design and it's a theme which has gone on through the years. Max Bill, the very austere Swiss artist, architect from the Bauhaus, took this view. Um, Elliot Noyes, who was the first curator of design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, again suggested that um, good design meant the obliteration of ornament and decoration. But there are other people who I think actually have much to tell us also about other interpretations of what we mean by design. 
design, uh, Ettore Sotsas had a remarkable career which allowed him to span both the world of making and emotional qualities to things and art, but also to work for Olivetti on designing a computer. And that sense that design needs to be understood in ways which have moved away from that simple idea of equating good design with a moral virtue, from equating good design with simply the pursuit of utility, which I think is a more neutral word than, than function, and that um, uh, one can say that uh, emotional qualities are, of, uh, emotions are a functional attribute of an object as well as a utilitarian one. And in the museum, we actually I mean, pose our visitors with a question, you know, what, is this a work of good design? Um, by some definitions, absolutely. It's cheap to make. It's reliable. It's mass-produced. A child can use it. And, of course, that is also the terrible aspects of what it is. But in terms of utility, it works. And we sit that next to a classic piece of 20th century design. Uh, this is a splint designed by Ray and Charles Eames in the 1940s. Uh, as a uh, battlefield um, aid to, to, to save lives in war. And it's a beautiful object as well. Um, but is this in any, any sense, in what, in how do we actually answer that question? But what do we mean by goodness in design? Then the idea of uh, the Museum of Design began to spread around Europe. Um, Britain's 19th century competitors, uh, especially uh, in uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, this is the Museum for uh, Angewandte Kunst in Vienna, began to build them as well. Uh, this is how it is now. Um, but you could say really that the, the model of the Victorian Albert, the, the idea of um, a Museum of Decorative Arts, really was the model for what uh, design in a museum could be right right until the time when um, the Museum of Modern Art got going in the 1930s. And, and you could say that uh, MoMA allowed design into a museum of art, but only by smuggling in, suggesting that it was actually a form of sculpture. So you could actually show a leger painting of ball bearings next to an actual ball bearing. Um, but the captions, the way that this was actually communicated to the audience, really restricted themselves to the physical form and the shape and treated design as if it was sculpture. Uh, but there were other views of what design might be. This was also the time when design was actually reaching its sense of expressing the exuberance of capitalism. Um, Raymond Lowy, uh, the archetype uh, self-publicist, uh, who could say he was the Philippe Stark of his time, understood that design was also about telling some pretty basic stories about embodying the sense of modernity and speed with, with a superficial ap application of style. Uh, he was also remarkably successful at, um, he was one of the first uh, industrial designers to hire a publicist whose specific brief was to get him on the front page of Time magazine, and he also managed to persuade the Metropolitan Museum in New York to allow him to reconstruct his uh, studio within the museum. And here he is beginning that myth of the designer as the heroic form giver, um, the man who was responsible for everything. And that's led, I suppose, to this, uh, the wave of the the sense that um, design might also have some, some rather negative qualities, the, the sense that uh, design is merely the application of a signature. Uh, it's the sense that you can actually transform something by appealing to people's um, more basic instincts. But in, in those days, uh, the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York was doing some things which um, would actually seem quite shocking to museum practice now. This was a show about useful objects for under $10, and they actually told you where you could go and buy the stuff afterwards, uh, which is a quite, quite interesting view of museum keeping. Um, and then we can actually see other approaches. This is the uh, Neue Sammlung in the Pinakotheka de Moderne uh, in uh, Munich, which uh, is a very old collection. They started collecting objects back at the start of the 20th century, and they moved 10 years ago into this new building where they sit side by side with a contemporary art collection. And this is the, the way that they present themselves to the public. Again, it's, I mean, this is the first thing that you see as you walk in, and it's a kind of table of contents which shows various approaches to design. So there is the wooden buck model at the top, which is showing the process that goes into design. Um, there's a, a range of design from the historical to the playful. 
Um, but to me, it's also still treating design in the museum as if it's sculpture. So there are a lot of stories that you could tell about these vehicles, which are the first thing that you see. Um, you could tell the story that this Czech Tatra in the foreground was designed by Ledvinka, an engineer who was later... Uh, um, forced, more or less, to work for um, uh, Alexander Porsche, who designed the Volkswagen in the background. And this is a series of vehicles which show that story. But for most visitors, this is um, a collection of sculptural objects. And I think one of the differences in showing design in a museum as opposed to, to other things is that it does require a lot more storytelling, that it's, it, you need to know who used something and for how long, how something was made, um, what its significance was. And whereas one can say that art speaks for itself in, in a much more powerful way. Collecting is, is a fascinating story. Um, this is an image from Paul Getty's diary. Um, he spent his whole life uh, filling notebooks in this fantastic, illegible handwriting. You can now find them online. But he was actually one of those collectors who started a museum. He was a collector who would randomly note down uh, the, tri the train timetable for his trip to Deauville, his meetings with Duveen, uh, a man he suggested looked much younger than his years. He talked about the price of carpets. Uh, he talked about the state of his digestive, digestive system. Um, and another sense of that kind of underlying passion behind museums, I think, is reflected in, in this image. This is Orhan Pamuk, uh, the Turkish Nobel Prize winning novelist, uh, who uh, actually trained as an architect before turning to literature, and wrote a wonderful book uh, called um, The Museum of Innocence, which at first sight appears to be about a doomed love affair, but actually is about um, the sickness that collecting can become. And I think collecting Collecting is this. Um, it, it's it's a, a, collecting is a spectrum, and at one end of this spectrum is the sense that an object, which you know everything about, and its previous ownership and its history, is imposing a little patch of order in this orderless universe, and that's about control. But the other end of the spectrum, collect, collecting becomes a kind of sickness, which is reflected by people who die alone in houses full of old newspapers and cat food, and power is actually, I think, talking about this in his book. So the book appears to be about a doomed love affair, but actually he describes how when the protagonist meets his beloved, uh, she drops an earring when they first meet, and he collects it and keeps it and puts it away. And as their relationship matures and then sours, he starts manically trying to collect everything she's actually touched, her cigarettes. When she stops speaking to him, he starts hanging out at her parents' house and purloining pieces of the cutlery and the crockery. And while he was writing the book, he actually did set out to create this Museum of Innocence in Istanbul. And here it is, and it's full of lovingly faked objects that uh, have no innocence in them at all. They're extremely knowing. And the first thing that you see when you come in is this wall of those cigarettes. That it does feel like Damien Hirst, actually, carefully annotated by um, Pamuk, creating that sense of the way that we look for meaning in everyday objects. So the, the more recent history of uh, more mainstream uh, design institutions, I guess, uh, begins with Frank Gehry's first building in, in, in Europe. Uh, this is the Vitro Design Museum. Uh, it's this, you know, it's, it, was, it was founded by Ralph Fellbaum, who asked that question about why do we pay so much more for a Mondrian than a Rietveld. And I think it was a remarkable act of courage uh, to give Gehry his first commission um, in Europe. Um, um, but the curators there, and they were started about the same time as the Design Museum, are in a slightly paradoxical situation because in this building they show historical artifacts with provenance and objects that show the passing of time and the deteriorations of time, which we value so much because we see these as measures of our presence and our memories. Um, but they have to deal with the fact that uh, Vitro is actually a furniture company, uh, which is also trying to sell 20th century furniture. And this is Herzog on de Meuron showroom on the same campus and uh, one of the curators uh, across the way was telling me that um, one of the problems they face is that they have to sell tickets to people who come in and ask why are we having to look at these uh, decayed old pieces of furniture when over there they're making Charles Eames brand new and it's free. 
So going back to the Victorian Albert Museum, this is uh, Pope Hennessy, um, for many years the uh, towering impresario over the V&A, who discouraged the idea of collecting 20th century work and mass production. And it was really his presence which triggered the foundation of the Design Museum, which began in the early 1980s uh, as a project uh, squatting in the depths of the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, known as the Boiler House. It was started by Sir Terence Conran, um, uh, a very successful British design entrepreneur who made a fortune out of selling what he saw as well-designed furniture. He went on the stock market and he used that to give something back to the community. He saw that as being a mission to remind the Victorian Albert of its original purpose, which was to look forward as well as back. Um, he, he commissioned um, Stephen Bailey, the first director, uh, to create a series of exhibitions within that space, which tried to look at some of the more uh, contemporary versions of what design could offer. Uh, this was the opening exhibition, uh, which was called Art and Industry, which is really looking back to the way that Henry Cole understood the role of the creative artist could offer to industry to give objects a character and a sense of meaning. Uh, it was there for uh, four years, and uh, the, then, the then director, Roy Strong, uh, and Stephen Bailey had one of those classic museum falling out, fallings out. Uh, uh, Bailey's version is that uh, his exhibitions were proving too popular, uh, and that there was a confrontation between the more established curators and, and Bailey's view. Uh, there was an ugly moment when Terence Conran suggested that Roy Strong should be stuffed and mounted as an exhibit in his own museum, but things have certainly improved in terms of relations since then. But it's interesting, uh, on the top l uh, right, left, um, that's th that is the first car ever shown inside Victoria and Albert, and you could see the, you know, the, the classic 20th century object has to be the motor car, but a museum of design that's not shown one until this moment seems to be missing out on something. Um, so uh, Terence's next move was to try to create uh, an institution uh, on his own to move the Design Museum out to its own building. He found a, an abandoned uh, banana ripening warehouse close to Tower Bridge, and one can see the ideology here. They turned this 1950s building into a, a miniature Bauhaus on the Thames. Um, you could see a kind of very strong ideological position in this, still that sense that um, you know, design is that view of the world based on um, rationally exploring a problem, the sense that design could in some senses make the world better. And I think our definitions have, have changed since then. I think we're much less keen on offering one view of what the world can be of design, but presenting the museum as a platform in which multiple viewpoints are possible, um, in which one can carry the whole range of what design can be. And, I mean, design is a kind of tribal thing the conversation that you have with an architect is not the same that you have with a fashion designer, which is not the same you have with uh, a software programmer or a coder. These are different tribes, but I think our intention now is to try and offer all those tribes a, a base and a platform. So we were here for 20 years. Um, we would look at every aspect of design, so this was using the idea of sport and the uh, pressures that places on materials to perform. Um, this was working with um, the fashion designer Hussein Chalayan. Uh, I mean, there is in the world of design uh, a long history of somehow thinking that fashion is this frivolous, superficial thing on the surface which could not be more wrong. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, of course, begins with textiles. There will be no digital world without the loom and the punch card. Uh, fashion is a way in which we express our identity, our sense of ourselves. This is work by Hussein Chalayan. I am a really interesting designer who really uses clothing to explore uh, the sense of those, uh, the sense of belonging, of purpose, and of technology. Um, this is a much more uh, traditional idea about the, the designer as an industrialist. This is the work of uh, the German company Braun with its great designer Dieter Rams. Um, but again, here we tried to actually explore uh, how design had bled into a wider culture. Um, Richard Hamilton, the great British artist, so long, sadly no longer with us, um, once suggested that um, the uh, Braun 
Toaster had in his aesthetic imagination the same place that Mont Saint Victoire had for Cezanne's, which is a big claim, but he actually came to see the show. I'm glad to see him. So my job when I was hired by the Design Museum uh, 11 years ago was to take these ideas about um, design as this kind of essential part of our cultural and economic life and take them and move them away from the sense of uh, the design world ghetto and find somewhere to give it a much more mainstream presence. The, 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 museum, the museums I've showed up till now, I think, have all treated design... It, well, there's two approaches up, up till now. One has been design and architecture have been placed in a department of a larger general museum, um, the Museum of Modern Art, um, the Centre Pompidou, um, uh, and the Victoria and Albert to some extent, have, have all put it in a, in, in a department where, in, in, the na in the nature of things, museums are full of bright, gifted curators all fighting for space, and in that context, design and architecture tend not to get that much space. Uh, or they've been shown in very small specialist institutions where there's a sense of talking only to the tribe and not to the world beyond that. And I've always felt that design and architecture are much too interesting and exciting to leave only to that tribe, to that ghetto. So our job was more or less shorthand to try and do for our subject what Tate Modern did in London for contemporary art, where one building and a series of extraordinary exhibitions within that transformed uh, the situation of uh, contemporary art in Britain from being something which was on, um, well, as far as the mass public was concerned, was somehow a trick or a joke into something which had become part of the wider conversation. So we were looking for some somewhere larger, somewhere that we could actually offer more, that we could actually um, offer people uh, a whole experience, which wasn't only about exhibitions, but it was about showing a collection and all the things that make museums places that are thriving. So eventually, uh, we were initially offered a space um, behind the Tate uh, building in, in Bankside, but decided that though it's nice to have five million people a year walking past your front door on their way to see uh, Anish Kapoor or Oliver Ellison, after 10 hours inside the Tate, they might not actually come and buy tickets with us. We looked at going back to the Victoria and Albert Museum, who were, it's, I think it's an entirely changed institution since the days that the Boiler House was there. Um, they were very welcoming, but in the end we realized that we wouldn't actually have enough space to keep our own sense of identity. So eventually we found this um, 1960s uh, monument, uh, formerly known as the Commonwealth Institute, uh, which when it was completed in 1962 was perhaps uh, London's most daring, quote unquote, modern building. Uh, there was, uh, right until 1960, there was still rationing for building materials in London after World War II. So there's very little new construction done. And this is one of the first buildings that, that actually did appear. And it was, uh, as a, as a schoolboy, it was a compulsory school visit. It was occupied by um, a, an exhibition hall, which was like a miniature World's Fair, which uh, every British Commonwealth member state had its own installation in. Um, I well remember Australia had a diorama, which, uh, which showed you the finer points of sheep shearing. Um, Canada had an Inuit totem pole and a snowmobile. Uh, Sri Lanka very regrettably shot and stuffed a tiger in theirs. And for 20 years it was uh, a place which um, initially seemed full of optimism and hope. The, the planning was fascinating uh, to try to avoid any kind of hierarchy. Uh, you, you came in into the center of the building and you could actually choose your own route through the building rather than having to have an order of nation states being presented to you. But like many utopian ideas, the roof leaked furiously and the insulation standards of the walls were, were, were very low. So, but by this time the building had been landmarked and, and couldn't be demolished. So we were given this chance to bring a, a, an icon back to life. And we worked with John Pawson uh, as our architect really to try and um, retain the sense of what the building had been um, spatially, but to actually make it work for our purposes. And, and uh, our, our strategy was to put our permanent collection on, on the top floor, which is free admission. And here we're trying to introduce uh, a wide public to 
design not only from the point of view of the designer, but actually also from the maker and the user. And uh, you know, that ranges from we, uh, this, this wall of objects as you come in was all nominated by the public online. We asked people what they thought ought to be uh, in a museum of design. Uh, so the mayor of London nominated the London Transport Roundel. Um, somebody else suggested that blue IKEA bag. Uh, I remember very well when um, the son of the founder of IKEA came to the museum and recalled a moment that um, he'd uh, been in the factory in Vietnam where this object is made and they were asked how strong should it be and uh, they, they decided that it should be tough enough to carry a, a four-year-old child in it. Um, there's the famous Ettore Sotsas Valentine typewriter and it's fascinating trying to, to explain to those digital natives that we were hearing about earlier what a typewriter is. One of my colleagues actually had uh, the, the good fortune to, to try to explain it to a very smart 11 year old who got it at once. Ah, a typewriter. It's a laptop that prints as soon as you touch the keys. Fantastic. And I guess that is a, one, one of the, one of, one of the um, difficulties for a museum of design because our, our world is changing so quickly um, that are we looking at objects which are defining what's happening next or are we recording some long remote past and our sense is that we, we do have this grounding, we show where designers come from and with this wall we're trying to suggest that actually any object if you explore it from enough angles and you understand it and you, 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 can, you can really learn so much from almost any object that it's, it's worth studying in that sense. But we also communicate through our temporary exhibitions program, which is a much more rapid fire response to the ways that we deal with the world around us. And, and I guess that's a kind of reflection of museum keeping as it's, as it's shifted from a period when the curator's job was to safeguard precious objects. Uh, you know, one of my primary um, memories for, from, for my, my, my life in the museum is that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where in the last scene uh, uh, Harrison Ford is in this gigantic warehouse and it's full of packing cases and the camera tracks back and back and back and just things disappear. And our generation in museums I think is trying much more to communicate to use those objects to tell stories. For us, not being a public museum, uh, a collection is a privilege and a burden. Uh, you need public money to look after precious artifacts. So for us, we don't want to acquire things unless we think we can actually show them and that they have some sort of purpose uh, you know, beyond the idea of simply keeping it. So you know, the public has... I think a very different experience of what museums are and I think also we, we are now at a time when we need reasons to switch off our screens and go and do something that is social, to do something with other people and for me that's another reason why the museum actually has this sense of possibilities, why they're becoming more and more popular and with our building I hope we actually created that sense of space which does feel inviting but also somehow special. So the idea of making is fascinating. Um, so this is in our permanent collection, and on one side is this slightly ridiculous object, um, which is a lemon squeezer. Um, but of course, its job is not really to squeeze lemons. It's actually a gift. You know, it's celebrating that moment when you actually give somebody something. Um, but actually, as an object, it's much less interesting than the artifact which, which, which made it. And I think at a time when so much of the world is now disappearing into slippery pixels, and the digital, we're still, also, we're still fascinated by how things are made, what it is that actually goes into producing something, how it's shaped by the technique and the process. Uh, Terence Conlon, our founder, always suggests that unless a designer knows how to make something, they can't truly be said to have designed it, which could be true. But I'm also quite interested by the Italian furniture designer, um, Ivico Magistretti, who used to tell his students that unless you were clear enough about a design, to be able to describe it over the telephone, you hadn't finished designing it. So when the Design Museum's predecessor began life inside the Victoria and Albert Museum, as I've said, the first exhibition was called Art and Industry. 
when we moved to Shad Thames, the, the opening show there was called Culture and Commerce. And when we opened uh, in 2016 in Kensington, the opening show was Love and Fear. And I suppose this, this shows the kind of the, ch- the, the distance that design has travelled in that period. Um, it's gone from being something which is about problem solving to understanding design as a discipline which can be about asking questions as much as it is about answering them. So with this exhibition, the curator, Justin McGurk, tried to show the global spread of design now. He commissioned designers and architects from around the world, from China, from Africa, um, from Asia, from Europe to explore some of the things that design was doing to the world which were provoking anxiety and concern as well as some of the more optimistic possibilities that design offered. So it went from a Dutch group that explored the idea of artificial intelligence against a backdrop of Japanese whaling fleets which are hunting to death some of the most intelligent um, mammals on the planet. Um, This was a project that was done by um, the Dutch architects OMA uh, which was uh, we opened uh, just after the referendum where Britain took the insane decision to punch itself in the face and uh, leave the European Union so this was called a house for Europe uh, which uh, the backdrop is um, Rotterdam the home city of OMA in ruins in 1945 sort of reminding us why the European Union might be a good idea Uh, and the Venetian blinds at the back are all Uh, abstractions of the national flags of the European states from which the Union flag of the United Kingdom has fallen you can see on the floor and the room is furnished with items of furniture from each of the 24 member states Uh, the British contribution is the wallpaper um, from Osborne and Little uh, the family firm uh, that owned by the Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time, George Osborne Um, this was a look at uh, sustainability Uh, this is a Dutch art artist Christine Miedersmite, who uh, really explored um, the way that fast fashion is uh, creating things only for landfills. We don't recycle the material that goes into cheap sweaters, mostly because we don't quite know what's in them, so she actually analysed and explored the contents of what's actually in a sweater, as opposed to what it says on the label, and these are very often different things, and she created this rather beautiful installation, um, showing that that there there is a lot to be said for, for recycling. Cycling. We also looked at the way that the digital world has completely changed our um, understanding of issues like privacy. In the smartphone, an object which is now only 11 years old, uh, it's remarkable to think that uh, uh, Steve Jobs launched it just 11 years ago, and even he, I don't think, could have understood that this one object could so change the way that we meet each other through um, the way that GPS maps our, our journeys around the world world, the way that we, I mean, without without the smartphone, there would be no Tinder, which would change the way that we fall in love. Uh, there would be no way, there would be no uh, Uber, which changed the way we travel. These things, you know, one artifact has really changed things so completely that we are still working through the unintended consequences. And I guess the role of a design museum is to be a place in which we might actually ask ourselves some questions about what this extraordinarily rapid pace of change is is doing to us Um, usually the the media look at what is new and what's next but what we need to do I think sometimes is to ask questions about why and I think that's also the role that design can now do more and more Um, we are now at a moment when that idea of the designer as a celebrity that Raymond Lowy Philippe Stark idea is something which another generation are not interested in at all it's fascinating to watch the way that design studios now name themselves uh, not against not not, not after an individual but, uh, but as an anonymous group that there is now a, a, a subculture which explores the impacts of uh, what current trends are doing to us rather than trying to design for industry. Uh, this was a second show that we did which was really exploring um, what it is about a generation who grew up in California who uh, 
went to India, perhaps took too much LSD, and then went home to start some of the world's most, com most valuable companies. And we're just looking at two different versions of the Californian dream. So on, on the one side is uh, the Harley Davidson, uh, written by um, Dennis Hopper in Easy Rider, One Idea of Freedom, and the other is uh, Google's Waymo self-driving vehicle, um, an object which obviously has been carefully styled to look as unaggressive as possible. Um, you know, it's not going to run you over, it's not going to eat you, it's, it's suggesting, and yet um, this is something which is fundamentally changing the way that we will move. Self-driving vehicles will destroy that sense of ownership and possession. We're very soon not going to own cars. These things will actually turn into uh, things that we might actually call up on our smartphones, that we might use for a meeting, which actually is just, just going to change the way that the cities work. Uh, we work sometimes with um, individual designers. This is a project that we did um, with Hella Jongerius, a uh, Dutch designer now based in Berlin, and she wanted to talk to the audience not about her own work, but about how she saw the impact of industrialization on color. And as she sees it, um, the world has become a much poorer place for sacrificing the sense of distinctiveness in color to predictable, um, mass-produced, uh, reproducible colors. So for her, Pantone is uh, uh, the work of the devil. Uh, it made me think about when we're doing this show, um, Ettore Sotsas uh, also was um, very uh, keen on using color in unpredictable ways. He wouldn't use Pantone either. And one of his assistants um, once, remem once told me he remembered that um, Sotsas was working on a project. And he said to his assistant, I want to use the color that my ex-wife's dress was for that party 10 years ago. Would you mind going around to home to see if she still got that dress? And could we borrow it to use it as the color reference? And that sense that color should be personal rather than industrialized was, was Jon Geras' uh, project for this show. Uh, every year we try and look at um, contemporary design from around the world. We do a show, it's the designs of the year, it's 100 objects from around the world. And I guess one of the things that a uh, you know, design museum does is live, uh, create a sense of choreography that might be seen as um, unacceptably uh, vulgar in an art museum. Uh, we are always trying to support the objects, to tell those stories, to show what those objects mean in ways which also make sense uh, in an economic way. So. Uh, this interior was designed by a firm of architects called uh, Kamadi Grok. And one of the terrible things about museums is that we're very wasteful. We do temporary shows, and most of the, the, the scenography ends up in a skip outside the museum afterwards for, for junk. So this is actually, these walls are made from recycled newspapers, which are usually used uh, as sound insulation. They're sprayed on. So for this show, we actually used this material. And after the exhibition was over, it was recycled once more to go back to being a spray material. And we do have some, some sense of history too, so uh, in, our, in our program every year we'll do six exhibitions. Uh, this was a project we did to mark um, the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, and we looked at um, Moscow and a series of major projects in it uh, for that year, and how um, the Soviet Union uh, removed its, uh, re uh, repositioned its capital from St. Petersburg, went to Moscow and created this series of landmarks which were trying to build a social metropolis. And um, I mean, I'm going to end on this, this image, which I think is trying to talk about how um, the museum's future does depend on a blending of that physical space, that experience of giving people that understanding that, that the museum is a place to go and turn their screen off. But we also do need to communicate with the world beyond. And this is uh, an image which uh, talks about um, our online presence. Um, we have 4.3 million Twitter followers, um, which uh, is a sense of being able to communicate with those who might never actually come and physically see the museum. So to end, design is in the museum uh, because it is a way to understand the world around us. And design in the museum needs to constantly understand that design is changing its shape with such speed and such uh, radical uh, developments that uh, we need to constantly be understanding what's happening next, to be understanding where this world that we're creating around us is taking us. Thank you so much.
if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Uh, if not, um, do come and see the museum. We are in West, in West London, um, and most welcome. Excellent. Eh, quería preguntarle si conoce usted el Museo de Diseño de Barcelona. Yes, I do. Uh, the Design Hub. Podría usted eh, Sorry, decirnos algo al respecto, por favor. Sorry. Could I have a translation? Yes. Okay, right. Um, so, we, of course, we respect our colleagues uh, around the world, and we try to uh, collaborate. Um, I was at the Design Hub um, before it opened and just after it opened. Um, I think one of the problems is that it's actually quite good to appoint a museum director before you appoint the architect. And the Design Hub was designed 10 years before it opened. And so, of course, it's been a, a heroic journey to try and make sense of the building under very different circumstances. Buenos días, yo quisiera preguntarle su opinión sobre si el diseño podría ser el arte de, del futuro. Fundamentally, des design has to be uh, an optimistic thing because any design is going to change the world that exists. Um, quite often, it changes the way the world is going to work uh, in unexpected ways. Um, the car was not intended to create the suburbs of Los Angeles or the traffic jam. Uh, it was intended to be a means of transport. Um, the smartphone was not intended to create um, the digital lynch mob which Twitter has become. Um, the founders of the Design Museum, uh, Stephen Bailey, uh, was, I guess, um, overcompensating for this inferiority complex that design sometimes has in regards to the other art forms. Um, he once provocatively wrote in an essay that if Michelangelo would return to the earth, he would not be wasting his time carving tomb sculptures for the popes. Uh, he would be in Detroit working on clay models to make Fords. And he suggested that, in fact, design would be the art form of the 20th century, but actually art is the art form of every century. I, I really, whoa, this is loud. Um, I really like what you said about uh, what you touched on with fashion, uh, design, and how it relates to and reflects back to society. Uh, so... One thing that I was sort of intrigued to find out was that uh, fashion actually played a pretty interesting role with the civil rights movement in the U.S. Um, and part of the way that they expressed themselves um, and changed the way they were seen or uh, also changed the way that uh, they were perceived. I'm wondering if you could just reflect a little bit about design, fashion, and how that relates to societal change. There's a remarkable image which I found for a book I published a few years ago, which shows the uh, Japanese imperial royal family in 1928. And the emperor is wearing a silk pot hat and a morning suit and striped trousers. And the, and the crown prince is wearing tweed plus fours, which I'm not quite sure how you translate that into Spanish, but they're kind of golfing trousers. And at that time, uh, Japan well, it was only 50 years, more or less, since uh, they'd opened up forcibly to... Uh, Western uh, trade uh, for many centuries even speaking to a foreigner was punishable by death um, so Japan decided that to stay the same on the inside as they put it they would change on the outside so that took the form of a stock market and education system in which they dressed just like Prussians and the idea that for the country to look modern they would adopt Western dress and then fast forward to the Paris collections of 1981 and Rei Kawakubo showed her work, the designer behind Comme des Garçons, showed her work in Paris for the first time and this marks the transition of fashion or dress being used to ex 
to express a subservience to an idea from elsewhere to being used uh, to show that Japan had become a transmitter of cultural ideas and was no longer a place which uh, copied or uh, plagiarized but actually had its own sense of energy and force. Um, there's so many different examples. Um, Ataturk in uh, Ottoman uh, post-Ottoman Turkey you could say was uh, a kind of art director. He abolished the Arabic script, introduced Western, uh, Western uh, Roman characters, he moved the capital to Ankara, he employed lots of uh, Austrian and German architects to build that capital, and he abolished the fez. Um, you know, clothes matter. Well, um, thank you very much.